Welcome to Keeping Up With Data. Keeping Up With Data is the podcast that keeps data enthusiasts up to speed with what is happening in the data world. We bring in the leading minds from the data industry to talk all things career, news, embarrassing stories, failures and successes. So something really important for us here at Precision Sourcing is mental health. It's something we've been focused on a lot over the last year or so. And we're lucky enough to have partnered with the Black Dog Institute. And we're going to be doing a lot of events with them this year. A lot of our events, money will be going towards them. And they're out there aiming to create a mentally healthier world for everyone. So if you wish to support the cause, please donate via the link in the bio on this podcast. And you'll be seeing a lot more information about Black Dog over the next year. So, welcome to Keeping Up With Data with myself, Joel Robinstein, and once again, my colleague, Emily Noda, woo! And we are joined by Divian Govender today. Divian, how are you? Well, thanks, Joel. Thank you, Emily, as well. Great to be here. Good stuff. And look, as we always do at the beginning of Keeping Up With Data, without me trying to tell everyone who you are, why don't you introduce yourself and tell everyone a bit about yourself? Yes, so I am Chief Data Analytics and Strategy Officer at Recoveries Corp. Um, been at this company for about three years um, in the broader data and analytics realm for about 20-ish years, shall we say. Brilliant. So uh, plenty to unpack if you've got 20 years there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, initially started my career in New Zealand, uh, did a number of different roles. <laughs> <laughs> Worked with the government a little bit um, between Auckland and Wellington, uh, did some stuff in telcos, did some stuff in banking, moved over to Melbourne um, about 10 ish years ago, and did a stint in Brisbane for a little bit as well. And as you said, back in Melbourne. Cool, good stuff. Well, look, I'm excited to unpack that and unpack that um, job title a little bit as well, because that's quite a mouthful. <laughs> um, and today we've got Emily on the streets. Um, special episodes of Emily in the Kiwi streets and we'll do our best data jokes as we always do as well but yeah very much looking forward to understanding not just about your career but also the industry that you're in Divian I think you're the first person to come on the show from that industry as well but um, look let's start from the very beginning so you mentioned 20 years in the industry what was the catalyst what made you start out in in the data world yeah look for me a um, bit, bit of background about myself I'm South African and I grew up on the east coast of South Africa, a nice, you know, sugar farm and you know, things you'd think would be fantastic. But I grew up during apartheid and um, mm. I guess the stuff in the media uh, really formed my personality. So you'd hear, you know, reports in the media and even through your history lessons, for example. Um, so I grew up in the kingdom of the Zulu, right? So strong, mm. powerful um, tribe in, in Africa. And you read in the history books in class that, oh, yeah, it was like this. And, you know, they had to resort to ambush tactics to win their battles. And I'm going, I live amongst these people. Mm. And I know that's not true. <laughs> so anyway, it got me kind of really thinking about, you know, what is truth? And for me, truth in many ways comes in, you know, hard facts. And hard facts for me is is data and having that curious mind and you know, questioning the norm um, is inherent to who I am. And I find data is a great avenue to be able to do that. That is such an interesting answer. I'd say that's easily the most interesting answer we've had from that. So it's from lived experience that you decided to then find a career within data. Um, To take a step back then, so, you know, obviously being British, maybe not a conversation we want to get into too much right now, but we hear a very different history from that. So I'd love to just even just learn a little bit about the history from, I guess, the Zulu side of things. What, what does that look like compared to the British history? Yeah, look, so the uh, so kingdom of KwaZulu Natal, uh, where I'm from, there were two brothers. So King Shaka, who's quite famous and you may or may not have heard of him. Um, he basically formed a movement uh, just slightly north of uh, where I grew up. And, you know, when the uh, British and other, so there was lots of Dutch settlement, obviously, in in the southern parts of Africa, when the Dutch and the British came from the Zulu accounts, there were, you know, concerted efforts to make peace. And, you know, for whatever reason, and we know times back then went fantastic. There was a lot of, there was a lot of bloodshed. There was a lot of, um, I guess, 
misunderstandings, but you know, a group that remained in South Africa has formed, you know, quite a strong, rich heritage. And for me, that's, uh, that's something that's quite admirable. I can imagine. Yeah, it's um, it's something we learned a lot about. I mean, if it's not a history podcast, maybe we'll move on quite quickly. <laughs> but something we learned a lot about at school. So it's always interesting to hear kind of the other side of things. And um, so you see, so yeah, obviously South Africa. So you stayed there till how old were you when you moved from South Africa? I was 15. Um, very difficult age to move countries because mm. you've got your family groups and you know your friend friendship groups very well formed. Um, I moved to New Zealand and you know initially was going, oh, this is a different country, different kind of mindset. But I got into sport fairly quickly and yeah, sports like a universal language made some very good friends, lifelong friends, and yeah, away we went. That's good. And whereabouts in New Zealand were you? Maybe more chat for you and Emily. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in Auckland um, for a, a large part of the time. Um, I played a lot of cricket in West Auckland um, for a club called Suburbs New Lynn. Uh, but I did work for the government, so I lived in Wellington for a while as well and played some cricket down there as well. Yeah, I'm from Wellington, so I know a lot more about that than I do about Auckland. To be honest, it's pretty bad. I've only been to Auckland, Auckland probably like two or three times now. And I pretty much lived there my whole, well, not whole life, maybe minus eight years. So poor form from me, but <laughs> both of you. There you go. I wouldn't advocate Auckland as being a, you know, a massive holiday spot. There's a lot of nicer places up north and lots of places, yeah, a bit further south. Auckland is a city. It's got its charms, but yeah, it's a city. So then when you first got into data then, so where did you start your career and what did that look like for you? So I had a really good lecturer at the University of Auckland. So I studied statistics and economics there. And um, a couple of the lecturers were the guys that created R, the package R. So, uh, you know, they, they were really passionate about the subject and, you know, the whole, you know, using data to, to make an impact. That was something that was really, really, um, you know, put to the forefront in all our lectures. Uh, completed an undergraduate degree there and then it was around the start of the year and the market was really quiet. I'm going, I've done a degree. I've got really good marks. Why isn't anything happening here? And um, ironically, on my birthday, I got a call from a recruiter who was working with the government and she said, hey, we've seen your CV. We think you'll be a really good fit. Had the interview and the next day I was going, yeah, OK, this is meant to be. Let's go for it. Nice. What a good birthday present. Yeah, really good. Yeah. <laughs> Kicked off from there, yeah. And so what's driven you towards leading teams, leading people? Is that just something that's always been in you as, as something that you wanted to do? Yeah, look, I've kind of had the luxury of working under some really, really strong leaders. And for me, you know, just learning and observing, you see how a leader, the right leader, can make a bigger impact, not by doing everything themselves, by using the team and using the team to their strengths, not okay, we're all going to do the same thing and try and get a good outcome. It's using the strengths within that team to get an outcome. Um, I guess having, you know, many, many years of sport and, you know, working with that kind of team dynamic, that's that's something that resonated with me. And for me, it's about the impact. You use the skills within the team to get that collective better outcome. Yeah, that makes sense. So who's the best leader that you have worked for? Because it's a question that we always like to, maybe not. You can yes. <laughs> It's difficult to narrow it down to just one, right? So very, very early on in my career, I had um, a leader who wasn't technical, but led technical people superbly. Yeah. And he was all about, you know, instilling that confidence because analysts technically are very strong, but they're typically more reserved. And this person was able to, you know, create that safe environment, get us to you know practice our presentations in a safe environment give us feedback both you know positive and things that we need to constructive feedback things that we need to work on and we just grew as a as a collective i think yeah he was probably the first that i'd say was one of an exceptional leader the second um was more recently and i admire this person because they are able to balance so much outside of work with um, the stuff that they've got going on. So very, very senior leader in um, 
one of the large telcos in New Zealand. She's able to do all this stuff at work, senior stakeholders having, you know, high performance conversations, but she's also got a whole lot of, you know, philanthropy and stuff outside of work. So if I was to narrow it down to two, I'd say it's yeah. those two. How have you seen that go, Emily? You know, obviously mentioning there about, you know, non-technical managers managing technical teams. Is that something that you see a lot of? I was going to say that's actually the, probably the biggest like bug bear I get from people on the market. Oh, this person's like, you know, a head of data, but we we don't really, you know, see eye to eye because they're not technical or they don't have that background. And like, so it's actually really rare that you, or I hear a lot of positives. It's kind of a lot of complaints, but maybe <laughs> that's just the position I'm in because people like to more look to move. But yeah, I mean, like uh, what I heard from that is that you kind of need uh, a little bit from like everyone, I suppose. You don't have one particular leader that you're going to learn everything from. You'll learn something from everyone in different ways. So that's that's awesome that you've got people like that. Do you either watch um, Ted Lasso on Apple TV? I've tried to, but I can't. I, can't, can't yeah. I don't know how to use Apple TV to like to a screen. Do you oh, know what I mean? Like, that's I don't annoying. Have screen anyway. Don't know. Anyway, he's like that. He's, <laughs> he's an American football coach. It's a comedy. It's stupid, but he's an American football coach who gets hired to go and work as a soccer coach in the UK and obviously he's like not he doesn't even know what the offside rule is but the point of it is he's like I'm a coach and I can coach anything and he has people under him who are the kind of technical managers who can do the tactics mm -hmm. and he's like at the end of the day if you, you're coaching the person more than anything so I guess sim similar to what you're saying there Divian you know you, you, you're leading the person and then if they're the technical expert then you, you give them the rope to be the expert on the technical side of things yeah um you made me think of first team. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, it was a one series show out of the UK about oh, yeah. this Premier League football club and they had an American there doing exactly the same thing. Not a soccer person at all, but trying to to lead or manage in that instance. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's going to work very I mean, I'm sure I'm <laughs> show, but you know, even still. All right, um, so let's talk a little bit more about what you're doing at the moment there. So uh, Chief Data and Strategy Analytics, Analytics Officer. Yeah, um, roughly. Oh. Chief yeah, Data tell us a little bit more about that. What, what that yeah, so um, we are in debt collection. So for many people, that means, ah, oh, you know, are you out there knocking on doors? No, it's nothing like that. It's about um, the strategy and the data to drive that strategy um, in terms of customer segmentation and um, working out, you know, what's the right, what we call treatment parts, what's the right um, sequence of activities and what's the right sequence of customer channels to get that outcome. So within my team, I've got a um, an area that looks after the data science, the dashboarding, the reporting capabilities. So those are your hardcore, you know, on on the, the data team. I've also got a, a second arm, which looks after the customer con content and communication. So scripting and, you know, the, the look and the feel, all the behavior economics that goes into because debt collection is not like marketing, right? It's no one or many, most people don't want to pay off a debt. If yeah. you have a debt, it's more like an obligation. So it's it's about creating that um, that mindset that yes, we will help you resolve your matter, move forward, and and go on. Or if they are in you know financial hardship, how do you get them to that point where yeah, the matter is at a certain point, and you can have you know hardship tools, et cetera, to help the customer through that journey. So that's the second team. There's a lot of, um, like I said, behavior economics that comes into it. The uh, final arm looks after the operational performance. Now, this is particularly relevant in uh, the current environment when we have, you know, work from home and, you know, people spread all over the country. So they are looking at workforce management metrics. They are looking at, you know, how are we doing in terms of our so customer benchmarking, client performance, et cetera. So roughly that's what we do. Yeah, okay, brilliant. And so data must be a huge part of, of that business is not just from tracking it, but how, can, how you can use it to use it as a leverage point in a lot of what you do. Absolutely. Um, we're working in an industry where margins are quite tight um, and, you know, you're seeing pressures from a you know both a consumer and a commercial front on on the economy there's a lot of strain on the economy at the moment and you know if you can with data make us you know a little incremental change here it's like you say it's the lever you make a small change using the data and it's going to make a massive impact on yeah. a larger scale 
can imagine. So have there been any large scale stuff ups as such in the business due to, you know, the fine margins and data being a leverage point? I, I, you know, we hear about, you know, a lot of companies, they think one thing and they haven't really used the data properly for another thing. Have you, have you seen much of that? Yeah, look, for me, it's about there, there are definitely instances where we get things wrong, right? But mm. as long as we're backing it up with data and they, I'll give you an example. So very, very early on in um, the pandemic, we decided, OK, how do we combine a couple of teams to see if we can get some efficiency there? Because clients were being very, I guess, hesitant on the referral side. Debt collection super sensitive, right? Mm. So clients are being sensitive. We're going, the work's not coming in. How do we combine some teams? Hopefully get some efficiencies there. We tried um, combining a dialer. It didn't go so well, but we found that out very quickly because we had the right tools, we had the right data, and we were in constant communication with our clients to say, okay, give us you know information on how we're tracking from a benchmark perspective. Um, didn't work because we moved yeah. backwards in terms of panel performance, um, but we reverted the change very quickly and yeah, very very soon after we were back to, to number one again. Nice. And then, do you find as a business that top-down data is respected and understood within the business? Because obviously in some other industries, maybe it's not as, as a bigger deal within the, within the company. Yeah, look, we've got a culture within our business. I, I guess it stems from the top. Our CEO is super passionate about data. He loves um sitting down with me we go through all the numbers and basically every time we catch up on a weekly basis or even more frequently he'll show me a graph or he'll show me something and go oh you know let's let's unpack this a bit more so you've got that all the way from the ceo down to your operational teams that are using dashboards using you know real-time information to change how they work and yeah yeah for us data is massive yeah, that's so rare. I feel like what you've just said, being a CEO quite deep into like the data and actually wanting to understand it, because like we talk about personality types at Precision all the time and like analytical driver, amiable and all those kinds of ones. And typically, you know, you get your CEOs and exec teams at like the driver, you know, just want to know what the outcome is, what the value is going to be for the business. Mm. But that's awesome that you've got that. So I see for your development as well. Yeah, it certainly helped me. I mean, progress within the organization to, you know, elevate into the C-suite. That's that's certainly helped. Um, and also we've got the backing of our South African company who are a little bit like you've just described. Tell us the outcome. But um, I guess on the board there, there's a couple of, I guess, people who were previous CTOs and things like that, um, like the technology, but also like to be backed up anything business case data show me the outcomes show me the projections so yeah it's good to have a mix yeah, totally. i'd say that's probably the biggest bugbear that you get from other chief data officers isn't it i mean in the sense that they're kind of the top level person who gets it and then it just almost stops there and then mm. you know they're like well they just i've done a year's worth of strategy and they've just gone oh yeah that's nice great <laughs> yeah, you know yeah that's exactly right i mean i hear that but that you've probably had that experience as well at the end. I find you have to be a little bit, I wouldn't say forceful, it's not quite the right word, but I guess firm with mm. your recommendations. And I guess have the backing of the right people. If yeah. you get the right people on board to say, hey, this is why I'm making a recommendation. Here's all the data to back it up. And here's the impact. Here's what it's going to mean for you. You, you find a way, put it that way. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's a question we ask a lot and people always skirt around it a little bit, but which job functions that you obviously have to deal with on a day to day basis, maybe not so much at your current company, but over the years, have you found not the hardest to deal with, but maybe the ones who just they don't get it as much or, you know, they don't know why they have to listen to you in a way. Is there a particular area? Yeah, Emily, you mentioned personality types, and I think this plays in nicely. Now, I don't want to judge and typecast because yeah. everyone in different areas is, mm. is different um i find and i worked within a marketing function before i find it very very difficult to um you know try and convince a creative person when they've got their mind set on something to consider an alternative um it it takes a lot of coaxing interesting they're definitely the function that comes up the most in our chats aren't they? Yeah, yeah brand and marketing that's usually the ones yeah, yeah. i'd say yeah to be fair probably more on the brand side than the mm. the pure you know below the line or um 
type marketers. It's probably more their brand function within marketing, I'd say. Yeah. Threatening their creative side. Yeah. You know, by questioning them. <laughs> um, well, good, good segue into finding out about some other people who don't know anything about data uh, with Emily on the streets. So we will um, pull up the question now. Now, if I remember correctly, Emily, this week's question was difference between a data analyst and a no, data, um, analyst and a data engineer. Yeah. So I think you asked five people. Mm -hmm. So we always say at this point, Divian, how many of the, and so this is a very special episode because Emily was over in New Zealand at the time. So this is Emily's family, <laughs> I love it. Emily's family that we've asked this question to. How many of Emily's family know the difference between a data analyst and a data engineer, do you think? Uh, I'd say maybe two. Two. Okay, cool. All right, let's get yeah, going. Mean. What is the difference between a data analyst and a data engineer? One person works with the data and processes it and one of them surveys it and inspects it. Data analyst analyzes the data to present to clients and the data engineer is someone in the background that looks at processes. Data engineer creates the machine and analyst makes the wording. So we're back in the room. We only had three, they're not five. That was my mistake. So how many of them do we reckon actually got it? I'd say zero. Sure. Zero? But like what do you reckon, Divian? I feel like that's some good. Like, they're, they're, yeah, I think they're headed in the right direction. You're right, yeah. but not, not quite there, but that's all right. Yeah. I like the ones, and you can't really hold it against the ones who are like, data analyst analyzes the data, and you're like, it's kind of true. Yeah. You know, fair enough. Like, there's not much more that you can say to that. Simple terms. Simple terms. All right. Anyway, so let's go to the best data joke for the week, oh. which is everyone's favorite moment, obviously. Um, do you want to go first or second, Divian? Uh, I'd prefer to go second because cool. humor is not my strong point. Okay, no, fair no, enough. Just low bar, trust me. Super low bar. Right, if we get a giggle or a, a snort, that's usually a good sign. Okay, here we go. Okay, go. What did the database admin say when he recovered a corrupted database? I don't know what did the database admin say when he recovered a corrupted database. Keep calm and query on. That's <laughs> good. <laughs> you got two laughs. I always laugh at myself. Yeah, of course, so you bad. always laugh at yourself. Yeah. That was pretty good. Oh, okay. Yeah, Thanks. I'm happy with that. You've got a lot to live up to now, Divian. How, how do I follow that? I don't know. I don't know. Follow that. That yeah. is so funny. Uh, all right, I'll tell a story, right? So, okay. um, many, many years ago, still an analyst, senior analyst at the time, and we were doing the trust session, you know, building a strong team. And, you, you know, we were giving constructive feedback. And a colleague of mine told me something quite confronting. She said, you know, when you look at data, your recommendations recommendations tend to be very black and white. Just thinking back, you know, okay, this is quite a quite a statement. <laughs> I look at my data, I go, you know, there's a hypothesis with statistical robustness. Does it make sense? Yes or no? But I try to apply a commercial lens to it. So I was like taken aback. Black and white, all right. So went to the bathroom, you know, splashed some water on my face. And I look myself in the mirror and I go, you know what? She's saying I'm either black or white, but she's wrong. <laughs> Clearly I'm brown. <laughs> See, that's a great joke. That's that actually a joke. So good, yeah. That actually is a good joke. story too. Yeah, I'm impressed. Oh, See, God. maybe humor is your strong point. Maybe you're selling yourself. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I love it. Well, good work, team. Today, I would say they were the best combo of jokes that we've ever had, so I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> All right. So let's get into some very, very uh, pertinent questions for today and this week because it's the election week. And mm. everyone who listens to this show regularly knows how much I hate our current prime minister, personal opinion, of course, uh, not precision sourcing's opinion. I'll put the caveat there. Um, if you had an audience with Scott Morrison, what data would you show him and why? Interesting question. See, I've got a, a real passion for climate change. I've also got a real passion for, you know, efficiencies. So I'd probably show him, for me, the rhetoric at the moment seems to be you either focus on the economy or you focus on the climate. Mm. And for me, they don't need to be mutually exclusive. I think you can find real benefit and i'll find the data to to help show him this in investing in you know a greener economy 
Yeah. That's probably the thing I'll put forward to him. And, you know, he might show me a lump of coal or whatever you might do. <laughs> so be it. That's brilliant. Do you know what? It's been really nice asking that question on this podcast because I'd say at least 50% of people have mentioned something about climate change, mm. greener future, which shows that it's it's kind of got across all different walks of life and everybody's, you know, thinking about it, which is great. If you're interested as well, I don't know if you listen to this, I know you said you listened to a couple of the episodes, but we had a guy called Ben McNeil on the show, who's a climate scientist. Um, and his episode was brilliant, just talking about how they're trying to use capitalism to benefit the greener future. Because he said, if you can figure out the money side, that's where the politicians are. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but yeah, maybe maybe Scott Morrison won't be the right person to tell that. Maybe we'll get a new prime minister soon and they'll be more open <laughs> to listening to it. So we'll find out. All right. Um, what is, let's get into some interviewing stuff. So you obviously, you've got a team that you, you manage, Divian. Um, um, any general tips firstly around um, how you hire processes that you use that you find will work really well um, because it's a hot topic right now in the market with it being so candidate short? Yeah, great question. Um, probably the thing I look most for is that ability to see the bigger picture, right? So technical skills, yes, very important. You need to, you know, have the right prerequisites if you, you know, if you're an analyst that's doing coding, you need to, you know, have that coding proficiency. For me, one of the most important things that I look for is having that bigger picture. And I'll I'll tell a, another story now. So sure. growing up in Africa, you know, traffic lights are where you can do your shopping, right? So everything happens oh, at yeah, a traffic course. light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big intersection, you can buy chickens, you can buy fruit and vegetables, you can buy clothes, you can buy everything. So back in the day, um, my granddad had a friend named Harry and Harry had a Datsun. I'm sure you know the car. No mag wheels at the time, so they had those hubcaps and yeah. the roads in Africa, he hit a bump somewhere and he lost one of the hubcaps. So he comes on, gets out of the car and his wife's going, oh, look on your driver's side, that's you've lost a hubcap. And he's like, that's no, fine, I got it sorted. <laughs> he drives down to one of the traffic lights and there he is. Um, this guy set up his little shop going, yeah, yeah, come in, Harry, I've got you sorted, have a seat. <laughs> So Harry has his seat, you know, has a little drink and he looks at his car and the guy goes, yep, all done, happy. Yeah, yeah, good, good. So he drives home, comes out of his door, shuts the door, is going to his wife, look, all good. Wife goes around the other side. What these boys had done is they'd swipe <laughs> the hubcap from the other side and put it around here. <laughs> so I always tell my team. Think about the bigger picture. If you look holistically, you'll see a different picture than just being in your narrow box. That's genius. What a great so story. Um, so how important is that for you? In the, in, first of all, having got to where you are in your career, but you've told some great stories already this podcast, and we drive it home as recruiters when we're talking to our candidates. Get in there, tell stories to get your point across. How important has that been for you to get to where you are in your career? Oh, so, so important. Particularly when you're dealing with really complex data or complex analysis, you try and give an analogy, make it, you know, really simple for your audience to say, you know, here's where I want you to get to and think of it like this. Mm. You make it very simple. Um, you know, it's a it's a common technique or common framework that tell it, tell it and tell it again. That is so, so relevant. And if you can do the tell, tell, tell with an analogy or with a story, it's even more powerful. Yeah, people don't listen to you telling to do something. They listen to stories that they connect with, right? So yeah. I would now be able to go and tell someone else about the Harry story about the hubcap. I'll remember that, you know? <laughs> so I'm, I'm impressed that you said that. And, and so how do you find that this is something that Emily and I try and drill into our candidates as well when they're interviewing. Um, for those who struggle with storytelling, we try and get them to use a technique, which is ask questions as you go. So, for example, you might ask a question of a candidate, Divian, of, I mean, how would you write this piece of code? I don't know. Or how would you solve this database problem? And then obviously the, the, the more technical candidate would say, X, Y, Z, this is how I would do it. And then typically just stop and then wait for the next question. And what we encourage people to do is to then say, well, this is how I've done it before. Is that how you would have done it, Divian? Or do you do it differently within your business? Do you think that's a good way for people who maybe aren't natural storytellers to create more of a conversation in an interview? Absolutely. Those open-ended questions, you know, the what, if, you know, describe, 
if you use those words and you elicit a bit of two-way conversation, it helps the naturally introverted person to, you know, get out there and, and have a more open conversation. Yeah, hundred percent. Because as I'm, you speak, you're a data science recruiter, Emily. So storytelling isn't necessarily the, you know, top characteristic of of a lot of people you speak to. Would you say? No, yeah, and that makes it um, preparation calls before interviews are like critical, you know, because you're obviously talking through those points, like really small little like nuggets that really help with, I suppose, interviewing when you're like what everyone calls a propeller head or whatever, mm. you know. Um, <laughs> But also on the same, I suppose, or different side, you get people who are brilliant at both and they're gold. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, that's what we're all looking for, right? Are there any um, things that really annoy you um, about candidates in interviews? Is it common themes that you go, if you see one or two things, you're like, oh, God, that's definitely not someone that I'm looking for. Anything in particular? Not really. Look, everyone's, everyone's an individual. And I think I like people to show that individualism, show what they bring to the table that makes them unique, makes them who they are. Um, if you're asking questions and you're getting just a, a one word answer, that that's really <laughs> tricky. And, you know, like you say, you try and use some open ended questions to get a little bit more from the candidate. But if they are very, you know, closed and not. Not forthcoming with some mm. examples, it, it's I find it <laughs> particularly annoying. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, if you can't get enough out of them, how are you going to judge if you want to hire them, right? So I guess that's mm -hmm. point number one. And then um, we find the other thing that seems to really annoy people at the moment is the lack of enthusiasm, unwillingness to maybe learn new things. It's like, oh, I do this, this is what I do, and that's what I want to keep doing. It's like, okay, cool, but would you be interested in this and doing that? And a lot of people are like, oh, well, no, I, I do this, and that's what I want to do. So mm -hmm. I think the way the data world's going with multi-cloud environments and all these new tools coming in, it's very difficult for those candidates who want to stay just kind of this is my thing because in five years I mean that's that's going to be irrelevant right mm. so yeah. anyway moving on um, into some questions about what would you do if you weren't working in data so I've got a passion for sport right I mm. played cricket for many many years with um, yeah some fairly successful people I don't think I applied myself properly um, to to cricket. It was more fun, and you know, had I played it a bit more seriously, I could have potentially ended up up there. So, um, a career in sport is very very attractive. Um, if I had something alternate, it probably would have been cricket. Cricket's not the sport that I watch mostly, though. I I would love to have the physique for rugby, but I could maybe yeah. stick on the wing or something like that. Um, yeah, just I played a little bit in primary school, but if I was to say one thing that I'd really like to do is be a Springbok and nice. win the Rugby World Cup with the Springboks if I could. Okay. Well, growing up in South Africa, then New Zealand, I mean, rugby is no surprise that that's kind of yeah. in your blood. Um, but cricket batter or bowler? Um, I started off as a fast bowler. And I had a few injuries throughout my career and decided to switch to spin. And that yielded a very successful end of my career. Yeah. <laughs> nice. If I need to start it out with that, eh? Yeah, but it is what it is and no regrets, right? Moving exactly, forward. no regrets. So what would you tell 21-year-old you at the time? Or what would you tell other 21-year-olds now that you, you know, you kind of, not 21 anymore, let's put it that way. Um, what advice would you impart on the people entering industry, shall we say? Yeah, when I look back to the person I was back then, I tried to please everyone. So, you know, when you're putting forward a recommendation based on data, I'd say focus on convincing the people who matter the most. Right. Back then, I'd try and please everyone. So there's a change going in. Most senior stakeholders are good, um, middle management, maybe a little bit lukewarm, I tried to please all of them oh. when I already had the key decision maker convinced. And I, I think, you know, it's human nature to try and be liked. And, you know, when you put forward a recommendation or, you know, a finding, you want that to be accepted, adopted, etc. Um, I'd say to anyone, just, you know, focus, you can't please everyone all the time. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you know what, that's actually probably the biggest change I've seen in you Emily, over the last couple of years as you've developed as a recruiter, you're less worried about 
not pleasing everyone, but you're much more willing to deliver the message that needs to be delivered in order to get the outcome that we would all want from a situation. I think it, mm. it comes with time as you get a bit more, more comfortable in your skin, would yeah. you say? Oh, yeah. That sounds like what's happened to you as well. Like, obviously, being young and 21, you're kind of, like, prone to thinking that way, right? I was definitely like that. So, yeah, but also you get the battle scars and the, like, mm. failures, and you're like, oh, my God, I cannot be bothered anymore. <laughs> so you pick and choose. It's like a um, process of elimination and, like, efficiency, I suppose. Yeah, you look back at it, you're like, if only I just said those two things that, I, that needed to be said earlier on in that process, we could have saved so much time at the end. And, like you said, the more times that happens, the more times you're willing to go, you know what, I'm just going to say it because it needs to be said. Totally. But I don't regret, I, I, obviously, the whole journey, and you're probably the same, to Vienna's like, those things that have helped you learn and grow and you get to where you are today, you might not actually be as good as you are now if you didn't have those things that came up. Or You're right. It forms you. It forms yeah. with who you are today. Yeah. Yeah, totally. 100%. So obviously you're working from home today, Divya, and I'd love to know what your company's current uh, plan is for back in the office and what you suspect is going to work for you and your team as well, because we've got a lot of opinions mm -hmm. out there about that at the minute. So we're currently doing two days a week in the office for me and for, you know, the the discussions we've been having. We need connection, especially mm. um, when you're trying to build a new team or you're trying to to form a, a specific type of culture, you need that human connection. So we've been dabbling with two days a week. Um, we're going to see how that works for us. Um, where I see the long term um, industry going, look, it depends on the type of team and the type of role that you're doing as well. Some roles, for example, our development team, we're going do they necessarily need to be in the office? All they are working on is the back end. So maybe two days isn't suitable for them. They 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 do come in, but it's not two days a week. Mm. Whereas other areas, if you have a lot of interaction and you know you need to have that um, collaboration time, it's best. Yes, Teams and Zoom and all of that does work to some extent, but when you're doing whiteboarding and things like that, it's just so much easier and more efficient face to face on a piece of paper, you can read expressions, you can read the room a lot easier. Um, I think an office setting is always going to have a place, but that's again, just my opinion. Yeah, that makes sense. And what about new people in the team? Something that we're dealing with ourselves in the last few months is when someone's new to the industry or new to the team, they need that connection more so. And then obviously you've got your senior people who you need to mentor and lead them and they get much more leeway of kind of work where you want and do what you want, but then the new people who could get left behind because of that. How are you managing that within your team in terms of the seniors versus juniors? Yeah, so I agree, particularly for, you know, those entry level roles, it's particularly difficult to do that remotely. Mm. And we've seen that in some of our attrition. And one of the data points that we track quite closely is attrition rates and um, retention rates and we've seen staff that have been onboarded remotely seem to to lead the organization at a much higher rate yeah. how we've tried to to manage that is we've got what we call our so your step your vertical teams so myself and all the data people but we've also got quite a good and a solid um, view on how we work horizontally across the organization so myself with the other c-suite the other execs we've got a day we're calling it our anchor day, but a day where we're in, we have lunch together, we make sure we've got that face time with the team, and then we've got the other day where we're kind of doing that amongst our team. So it's, uh, I can't say it's easy, but um, it, it's something that we are constantly evolving and adapting. I think over time, you're going to start seeing, you know, people working out, does it need to be a certain you know, time period initially where you are in the office just mm -hmm. to get that, you know, learning from others. Um, uh, I have no idea how long or short that might be. With us. Yeah, mm. what I like what you said, though, is and what we're finding is working better for businesses is the more individualized flexibility policy. So like you said there, devs may need something different from an analyst who needs something different from, you know, an analyst in the team who's got kids versus an analyst who hasn't got kids. You know, it's we're finding the blanket policies are failing. The individualized ones are great, but they're only working if you've got strong enough leadership to help everyone understand that in order to treat everyone the same, we kind of need to treat you differently. 
So mm. are you finding there's a, a, any push or pull from people in the team or why are they getting that and I'm not, or you've not really kind of hit that time yet? No, look, we've been quite transparent in terms of what we're doing um, in terms of, you know, an overall strategy. And coming into the office, it shouldn't be a drag. There should be a purpose and people should enjoy, you know, coming in, getting the buzz, working with each other, um, you know, creating a little bit of social interaction as well at the same time. So yeah. I can't really say we've had too many, I guess, you know, pushbacks or things like that. People know we tailor for individuals and right. we are in an inclusive workplace, right? There'll be, you know, people with disabilities, people with, you know, very different um, family lives, different personal circumstances. We try to, you know, to cater as much as possible to all of those things. Brilliant. Yeah, no, it's, mm. it's, it's, I think a lot of companies are failing because they are not explaining to people why they should be back in the office. Mm. And then certain people are going into the office and being sat on Zoom for eight hours a day. Yeah. Thinking, <laughs> okay. So, yeah, it sounds like you guys have a bit more of a handle on the transparency piece, which is obviously key. Yeah. Totally. All right, so we're just coming in towards the end of the pod now, Divian. Um, and uh, normally at this point, we'll ask you questions around, you know, why should people work for you? And it's your chance to do a little bit of a pitch and stuff like that. But there's one fun question that we haven't asked in a little while. And I'm going to ask you because Go for I it. enjoy it. Um, it's a would you rather question. Mm. Um, and we've asked quite a lot of people this over time. But it tells a lot about your personality as well. So would you rather have your whole Google search history released to the office or you release everybody else's, but they know it's you that did it. <sighs> I'd probably say the first one because yeah. most of my search history is either rugby or cricket. <laughs> There's okay. nothing to hide there. But I quite like the idea of the second one because <laughs> it's a bit of fun. <laughs> you also know? find out so much about people, it would be hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> it would be really dark. Yeah. You, it, like really dark if that happened but you're right and you know what it makes it sound like you're in one of those offices a bit like ours where maybe everyone knows everyone a little bit more you're quite a tight-knit group because it's mm. you're then like it'd be quite funny to do that to all my colleagues yeah. <laughs> I think if you worked at Commonwealth Bank and you did that it would be a whole oh uh, yeah a very different story yeah, I yeah, can imagine. Very different yeah. Story. what did you say do you remember when we did this for you uh, I'd leak everyone else's. Yeah, I'd leak everyone else's too. <laughs> but that's just because of where we work, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so let's just do the, the, the questions at the end we do, which is around, well, why should someone work for you, Debbie? What makes you a good leader? You know, we're, we're all looking for candidates at the minute where they're not now, but I'm sure in the next six months. So your chance for a little sales pitch for both yourself and Recovery Corp. Yeah, let me start with the organization first. Look, Recovery Corp, we started off as a family-owned business. We've gone through a number of iterations. Um, for a data professional, there's so much emphasis on data and analytics in driving the business forward. It's part of our vision. Um, it's something that, you know, all the way from the CEO right down to our frontline staff, everyone's using data and it's such a good tool and such a good, um, I guess, area to work in. You can really make an impact if you work mm. um, at Recovery Scorp and you are a data and analytics professional. Um, for myself, look, I am, I won't claim to be anywhere near perfection, but I work really hard to be a good leader, a supportive leader. Um, I create a team where there's ownership, accountability and responsibility. Um, empower my staff, but I make sure that I'm there to support them as well. Brilliant. It's a very good sales pitch and uh, nice and easy to succinct. Yes, yeah, succinct, which is good. Um, well, look, thank you so much uh, for coming on today, David. Is there anything that you, we've missed or any stories that you, you'd like to tell about a, maybe a different grandpa's friend, Harry, that we've missed? <laughs> no, we'll, we'll leave it there, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Fantastic. Thank you, Emily. No worries. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Obviously, hope everybody enjoyed that. And we'll be back once again um, in a couple of weeks, as we always are. But for now, Divian, thanks again. Thank you.